In this interactive video, we're going to look at some more concepts of Buddhism. So, starting with really the, the main Buddhist concept, or certainly the, the most uh, well-known, is um, that of the Four Noble Truths. So, the Four Noble Truths, according to Buddhism, are simply these. First, life is suffering. Just accept it and kind of get over it. And number two, the cause of suffering is selfish desire, craving, wanting. That's why we suffer. Three, there is a way to overcome this selfish desire and craving and wanting. And four, this way is called the Eightfold Path. So just to expand upon each of those a bit, life is suffering, right? Like I said earlier, just accept that right off the bat and stop trying to fight it. It's physical suffering, psychological suffering, and spiritual suffering. Birth, age, death, sorrow, longing, pain, not getting what you want, craving. All of these are forms of suffering, and that is the stuff of life. Second of the noble uh, four noble truths, cause of suffering is selfish desire slash craving. And what this means, or what this entails, is that this is conditioned by ignorance of the nature of reality. Craving for sensual pleasures, craving to simply exist, or to exist as a this, or as a that, or craving not to exist, or to escape the truth of suffering. All of this is what causes suffering. But there is a way to overcome suffering. We can be liberated from this craving and this selfish desire. It is indeed possible to rid oneself of it. And that brings us to the fourth of the um, Four Noble Truths, which simply says, this way is the Eightfold Path. Um, so in conjunction with the Eightfold Path, um, it's, uh, the elephant metaphor is often employed. And um, the idea is that the best and most effective way to train a wild elephant is to yoke it to one that's already trained. So you've got one who has, who's completely wild. The best way to break it, for lack of a better word, is to yoke it onto one that's already trained, because the trained one is going to base it is going to effectively subdue the wild one. And this is what this metaphor is intended to um, to illustrate that. The Eightfold Path is, is, is essentially how you yoke a human being, how you train a human being. So here is the Eightfold Path or the yoke of the Eightfold Path. It's composed of right view, which is essentially the rational acceptance of the Four Noble Truths. You know, not just accepting them on blind faith, but coming to the realization that this is, these are the Four Noble Truths, rationally. Uh, right intent, which is full-hearted commitment to the journey of enlightenment. Right speech, which is being aware of your speech in terms of your motivation and your truthfulness, first and foremost, and then practice charity in your speech. So essentially be careful with what you say. Um, right conduct. And that means to understand your behavior more objectively first, and then practice what's what are known as the five precepts, which is do not kill, steal, lie, be unchaste, 
or drink intoxicants. Um, right livelihood, which is to engage in occupations that promote life rather than destroy it. Essentially saying you have a you have a choice in what you do for your livelihood. Choose one that serves to promote life rather than destroy it. Right effort, um, a low level of volition, a mere wish not accompanied by action and effort will not do, right? You've got to really want enlightenment. You can't be like, yeah, that'll be cool for a while, right? And that's what a low level of volition, eh, yeah, I could take it or leave it. Or I sure do hope I become enlightened. I mean, you got to be committed. That's the idea behind right effort. Uh, right mindfulness, and that's to cultivate awareness of every action that's taken, every single action you take, and every thought that turns up in your consciousness. Cultivate an awareness of them. Do anything automatically or without understanding your um, your intentions or the nature of your um, actions and and your um, ideas and right concentration that's achieved by the practice of meditation so um there is he actually died in 1997 so he's not so much contemporary but more so than other buddhist than many other buddhist scholars his, his name was walpola rahula and like I said, he was a Sri Lankan Buddhist scholar, and he interprets the fourth noble truth and explains why it's the middle path. So he takes that, um, he takes the eightfold path and breaks it down into categories. And it's really kind of cool. So I thought I would, um, and, and, and enlightening in and of itself. So I thought I would share that with you. So Rahula says the eightfold path is not to be practiced one after another. Like first do um, right effort and then do right concentration and then do right views and then do right speech. Right? It says it's not linear. They all should be practiced simultaneously according to the ability of, of the given individual. And he says that these eight factors aim at promoting and perfecting the three essentials of Buddhist training and discipline, like essentially the three principles, right? Which he says are ethical conduct, mental discipline, and wisdom. So then what, as you'll see in a moment, what he does is, is what Rahula does is takes those, those um, takes the eightfold path, those eight different, um, you know, components of it and splits them up into these three essentials of Buddhist training and discipline. So first of those three is ethical conduct, which means love and compassion toward all creatures. Well, how do you cultivate ethical conduct? Rahula says it's developed or cultivated by practicing these three from the Eightfold Path, right speech, right action or conduct, and right livelihood. So again, right speech means more specifically, it means abstain from telling lies, from backstabbing and slander, from harshness and rudeness and impoliteness, abusiveness, from idle babble and gossip. And once you don't do all that kind of stuff, that's only going to leave room for truth telling, pleasantness, gentleness, and meaningful speech. And then if you don't have anything to say that fits these categories, keep silent. That's right speech unpacked a little bit more, which is one of the ways to develop ethical conduct. Then right action or conduct. Um, promotes moral, honorable, and peaceful conduct. 
don't destroy life, don't steal, don't have dishonest dealings or illegitimate sex, help others do the same. And then right livelihood, don't make a living through a profession that harms yourself or others like arms trading or dealing in intoxicants or killing animals, etc. Choose something that doesn't involve harm, direct harm to yourself or even indirect harm to yourself or others. If you practice these three, you are developing ethical conduct, which is one of the essentials of Buddhist training. Then the second essential of Buddhist training is mental discipline. And mental discipline is developed by practicing this one aspect of the Eightfold Path, which is right effort, according to Rahula. So right effort unpacks this way. It means the energetic will to prevent evil and unwholesome states of mind from arising in the first instance. And then to get rid of those states if they have arisen in a man or a woman, but that was the way of speech when he wrote, um, to produce or cause good or wholesome states of mind if they have not yet arisen, and or to develop and perfect those good states of mind if they're already present. So what this means is that you absolutely have the will to say to yourself, hey, in myself and in others, anytime evil and unwholesome states of mind come up, I'm gonna I'm gonna push them away. I'm gonna keep them from from even or it's essentially I'm gonna do things that prevents them from even coming about in the first place, right? But if they do come about in myself or in others, then to the group to the degree that I can, I'm going to get rid of them in myself or help get rid of them in, in others. Or, and then once that's handled, I'm going to try to produce or cause more wholesome states of mind, right? Cultivate more wholesome states of mind to take the place of these evil and unwholesome ones that have taken hold, right? And then once I can get those working, I'm going to like refine and develop them and perfect them and take the ones that had already been there and allow them to grow and flourish as well. So right effort is the aspect of the um, eightfold path that you practice in order to develop mental discipline, which is the um, second essential of Buddhist training. Oops, I forgot this one. <laughs> and then there's a right mindfulness as well. So this also helps to develop mental discipline. In addition um, to right effort, right mindfulness does. And that means to be diligently aware, mindful, and, att and attentive with regard to um, your the activities of your body, like your breathing. Pay attention to your breathing, um, your sensations or feelings, right? Whether your feelings are pleasant or unpleasant, you kind of notice that rather than just, um, you know, be happy or be sad or be in pain, step back and cultivate an ability to notice like, hey, I'm really happy right now, or man, I'm really pissed right now, right? There's a difference between allowing the feelings or the sensations to take you over versus having them and noticing that at the same time, right? So that's part of right mindfulness. Um, pay attention to the activities of the mind, Right, the quality of the thoughts that you that you're having are they hateful, lustful, distracted? So don't you know we've all we all go through this. We've all hated something and been in a full state of hate. We've all lusted or been distracted, but it's different when you're going, man. I am really hating this right now, as opposed to just hating, or man, I am really lusting right now, as opposed to just lusting, 
or like, whoa, I'm so distracted. I can't, I can't get it together. That's different than just being distractive. So you're supposed, it's taking like a, um, and a more, an ob objective, um, stance toward yourself. And then ideas, thoughts, and conceptions and things. What's the nature of them? How are they developed, suppressed, destroyed? You're supposed to pay careful attention to what's going on in your head. Like when an idea comes up that maybe it is deeply unpleasant and it seems to come out of nowhere, like where actually could, what could have caused me to start thinking this way? Or um, if you just, if there's a certain idea about the world that always brings you displeasure, um, or feel an attitude of hatred instead of just going with it. Like, why on earth do I have this idea? And more importantly, why do I cling to this idea? Are there other possibilities that I perhaps am ignoring that may be more, um, not, not just advantageous, but more charitable and um, more, more productive in the most robust sense, right? It's mind work. And then also right concentration, um, which can be called trance or meditation. So this just breaks down what the, um, what the phases of meditation are supposed to be. Right. So first stage of meditation, your cravings and unwholesome thoughts are, are discarded and feelings of joy and happiness are maintained. This is what you're supposed to try to do in the first stage of meditation. In the second, um, all intellectual activities are suspended. Tranquility and focus are developed. Feelings of joy and happiness are maintained. Again, this isn't supposed to be magic. This is supposed to be what you strive to do. It's supposed to be really, really difficult. It is mental ninja stuff. Third stage, the active feeling of joy disappears, but the disposition of happiness and tranquility remains. And then the fourth stage, all sensations disappear and only pure equi equanimity and awareness remain. So what Rahula is unpacking here is like, this is how it ought to happen if you're doing it correctly. It's almost like, like if you were to go to the gym and, um, you know, and you had a trainer and they weren't just saying, you know, do, do 50, three sets, 15 reps of whatever. And they're actually telling you, look, this is what's going to happen. If you keep doing these particular reps of this particular exercise over time, first, this is going to happen. Then this will start to happen. Then this, then this. So have faith and get this going, right? So that the others can unfold. That's kind of the idea here. And then the third um, essential of Buddhist training is wisdom. And wisdom is developed by practicing right intent. So what right intent means is, um, or denotes thoughts of selfless renunciation and detachment, thoughts of love and nonviolence, which then extended to all beings, not just human beings or the ones that you like or the ones that are, um, that live in your country or part of your culture, part of, you know, part of your sex or whatever the case might be. True wisdom is colored by these qualities. Um, ill will, selfishness, selfishness, hatred, and violence are the result of a lack of wisdom and perpetuate it. And wisdom is also developed by practicing right view. And that's the understanding of things as they are. And it's the four noble truths that explain things as they are. And there are two sorts of understanding according to Buddhism and specifically according to, um, to Rahula. That's knowing accordingly, which means this. 
knowledge, accumulated memory, grasping of a subject, um, and the data associated with it, you know, like knowing stuff like this, like knowing that a mammal is something that is warm blooded and that bears um, have live young and, or, or, you know, bears, bears live young and have body hair, etc. And that's not very deep. Knowing accordingly is not very deep. But then there's penetration. And that's seeing a thing in its true nature without name or label. And it's only possible when the mind is free of impurities and fully developed through meditation. Okay, just a few more Buddhist concepts. There is nirvana. And etymologically, that means to blow out or to extinguish. Um, however, Buddha maintained that it was impossible to define affirmatively. One can only say what it is not. We've seen this before with Hinduism. It's like, look, I can't sit quite say what nirvana is, but I can tell you what it is. Basically, it's what's left when we've extinguished the fires of attachment, aversion, and ignorance. So this is Edward Kahn's, and he was a scholar of both Marxism and Buddhism. And he said um, this of Buddhism. Nirvana is permanent, stable, imperishable, immovable, ageless, deathless, unborn and unbecome. And it is power, bliss, and happiness, the secure refuge, the shelter, and the place of the unassailable safety. That is the real truth and the supreme reality. That is the good the supreme goal, and the one and only consummation of our life, the eternal, hidden, and incomprehensible peace. Another important uh, Buddhist concept is that of anatta, and that's the, the no-soul view. So Buddhism denies that we have any type of underlying self, or soul and this explains why the why buddhism denied the hindu concept of the transmigration of souls right if you don't have a soul how can your soul transmigrate so the no self doctrine where the self is defined as some permanent eternal soul substance that animates our bodies and is used to explain how we can have free will that's the notion of anatta and um i think that that we in many of us in the west have a really strong you're and the term just have a really strong sense of self and i know who i am and i'm a this type of person but not a that type of person and you know i'm a cat person but not a dog person and this that and the other Anada would say, you're not any kind of person. There's no self in there. You're, this self that you think is enduring, that has all of these enduring properties um, that continue across time, and that somehow you can find your true self and get rid of your fake self. All of this is baloney, effective, Buddhism would say. It's an illusion. It's an illusion that's kind of muddied the waters for you. And you, first of all, you don't, you don't need it. And second of all, it's standing in your way of understanding the true nature of number one, yourself, and number two, everything around you. So just to unpack this even a bit more, um, so Anatman or Anada is kind of the same. And um, notice that the Atman was the soul in Hinduism. Right, so anatman is no soul, it's shortened off into anatta, and the five aggregates. Um, again, the concept is there's no permanent self or soul, but instead we're like this composite impermanent entity, this anatman, that's composed of five aggregates, five different pieces that come together. 
and each of these are subject to the three marks of existence, which are impermanence, suffering, and absence of self and soul. So these, the five aggregates are here. You've got your physical body, which is your outward sensory form. You've got your sensations and emotions, um, which are like responses to sensory data. You've got conceptualization, which um, are, is processed responses to sensory data. You've got dispositions to act, which are biases produced by sensory data, often known as karmic constituents. And you've got um, consciousness, which is awareness of self and senses. So instead of some self inside, some permanent, permanent self, like robust self that you have in there, really all you are, Buddhism would say, is this aggregate of these five things. You're these five things, and these are these all change constantly. You're never the same self from moment to moment. And if you think you are, it's an illusion. And again, it's an illusion that's standing in your way toward enlightenment. And, and if you're interested, um, and I will, if you're interested, there is something called the simile of the chariot. Um, where it's a dialogue and it's in the Melinda Pana and it's a dialogue between King Melinda and an enlightened Buddhist monk named Nagasena and it revolves around the nature of the self where they use the chariot to um, explain this concept of no self like um, you know I think it goes something like hey what is that you know show me the chariot and one of them points to the chariot. The king points to the chariot. Well, is the wheel the chariot? Um, no. Is the seat the chariot? No. Is the, um, you know, the reins the chariot? No. Is the covering the chariot? No. It's every one of these things put together and then we just label it chariot all of these things have to work together so it's meant to kind of you know that little simile is meant to debunk the more robust like western notion of this permanent self that we have it, it's a cool little um simile and then big raft and little so the questions that began to divide buddhism are the same ones that have divided any religion. Are people independent or interdependent? Is the universe friendly and guiding, hostile and challenging, or indifferent? And what is the greatest feature of humanity, the head or the heart? Well, Buddhism divided breaks down into what's known as the little raft or the big raft, two different um, schools of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. So in Theravada, human beings are emancipated by self-effort without supernatural aid. But over here in Mahayana, human aspirations are supported by divine powers and the grace they bestow. See the difference right off the bat? Um, key virtue for Theravada is wisdom. For Mahayana, key virtue is compassion. Theravada, attainment um, requires constant commitment. And it's primarily for monks and nuns. And for Mahayana, religious practices relevant to life in the world and therefore to everybody. Um, the ideal in Theravada is the Arhat who remains in Nirvana after death. And in Mahayana, the ideal is the Bodhisattva. I always mess that up, Sattva, Bodhisattva. <laughs> and over here in Theravada, uh, Buddha is a saint, supreme teacher and inspirer. 
from Mahayana, Buddha's a savior. Theravada minimizes uh, metaphysics. Mahayana elaborates metaphysics. Theravada minimizes ritual. Mahayana emphasizes it. Theravada practice centers on meditation. And Mahayana includes um, petitionary prayer. So little raft versus big raft. And that are, those are two different schools of Buddhism. Okay, in this video, we went over the Four Noble Truths, um, the Eightfold Path, and we specifically took a look at how um, the Sri Lankan Buddhist scholar uh, broke down the Eightfold Path into those three different categories, which were the essential trainings of um, uh, for Buddhists, any practicing Buddhists, uh, basic Buddhist concepts, and Big Raft and Little Raft.